Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Budang Damang Sanghang Nama Sahami Right. World premiere of the Clear Mountain Choir. Way to go, everybody. That was really beautiful. Sadhu. Thank you, Chinita. Thank you, everybody. Um, so before we uh, began today, we had a, a board meeting. So um, there's, we actually have two not-for-profits. We've got Clear Mountain Monastery, which is the monks, currently Ajahn Nisabo and I. And then we got Friends of Clear Mountain Monastery, which is a lay board who kind of looks after donations and really guides us in, in many different ways. But one of our board members is transitioning out of their position. So we had a, just a celebration of gratitude for this person. And someone who is Steve brought cupcakes, which was great. And we basically just went around and uh, shared gratitude uh, for this person and for each other. And it was just a really beautiful time. And one of our board members, um, was just sharing things about everyone, and then it got time for them to share gratitude for Ajahn Nisibo and I. And we were sitting just like this, he was on the left and I'm on the right, and this person says, you two are just such a good balance. And then they start doing like this, like one hand is you know, possibly referring to each of us for the qualities she was about to name, which were one of you are, you know, we've got intelligence, and we've got heart, <laughs> and we've got depth, and we've got and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't hear the rest of the adjectives because uh, I was just trying to, you know, which one, which one am I? <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think we decided that I was the intelligence. Uh, yeah. But it was, he, yeah, he got depth and heart. And you got heart, which is significant. Warmth. Yeah, well, but this is the thing, yeah. This is uh, on the theme of, yeah, self-identity um, and how we hold how we hold these different perceptions about ourselves, perceptions of others, and that's really at the heart of the Buddha Dhamma, uh, of the Buddha's teaching. Uh, what we're given in pretty much all of the Buddha's teachings are a different way to look at the world. Um, in the second discourse of the Middle Link Discourses, which we'll be going into on Sunday nights, as Ajahn Nisibo mentioned, uh, the Buddha says that uh, there are certain mental uh, hindrances which can be abandoned by seeing correctly. And so rather than seeing or looking at the world in terms of me and mine and the stories about me, how was I in the past, what was I in the past, having been what, what was I in the past, or thinking about ourselves and our self-narratives in the future, what will I be, having been what, what will I become, or even in the present moment being inwardly perplexed with what he calls a thicket of views a writhing of views, a forest of views, a fetter of views, all of these super apt uh, you know, words for what we do in the present moment. We just think, oh, I'm like this, I'm like that, and it causes problems. Oftentimes they're workable if it's somewhat realistic, the ideas that we have about ourselves, but oftentimes it causes problems when these self-views are met with some kind of dissonance with the way that others see us or when we change. And this is one of the principles that the Buddha pointed to that is that all conditioned things are subject to change. So we can't hold on to those, these labels of ourself so tightly. But in terms of labels, um, I think one interesting, just personality type wise, you could talk about people who are lovers this is a Jungian archetype, and Listers. That's not a Jungian archetype, but it's uh, somewhat, it's a different, yeah, different schema. But um, if you love lists, we got them. Theravada Buddhism, so many lists. And um, we did a retreat a couple months ago where someone said that they didn't like retreats, and I was flabbergasted. What's that? They didn't like lists. They didn't like lists, thank you. What did I say? Retreats. Oh. Excuse me. Yeah, they didn't. They said they didn't like lists, and um, was just astonished. And but 
yeah, hopefully, you know, everybody, you've got your own proclivities and uh, what you bring to this, but the Buddha's lists aren't just lists for lists' sakes. The Buddha says that all of his teachings, just like the Great Ocean, wherever, if you go to the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and you get a glass and dip it in the water, it's all gonna have the same taste, the taste of salt. In the same way, all of the Buddha's teachings have the same taste, the taste of liberation. So these are lists for liberation. And one of the fun on a cognitive level uh, aspects of the Buddha Dhamma is when you compare and figure out creative ways to um, bring these different lists together. So I've already mentioned, or we mentioned a lot, the Four Noble Truths, that there is unsatisfactoriness and we cause ourselves that through our craving. There are three types of craving. Uh, it is possible to get rid of our own suffering by getting rid of those three types of craving. And then there's the fourth noble truth, the Eightfold Path. And each one of these aspects of the Eightfold Path has different lists. You've got two types of right view. Uh, you've got three types of right intention, four types of right speech, uh, four types of wrong livelihood. Um, you've got three types of wrong uh, bodily action, wrong action, and so on. Uh, but seeing how these lists compare to each other and draw nuances from one another. When you look at how these lists compare and how they feature in the whole Buddhist teachings, it can really uh, draw out and enhance our own practice. So two lists, which I've recently been comparing in my own practice, are the five precepts, which everyone just, or those who wanted to, uh, recited, uh, what we chanted together, and the five, what are called the five hindrances, so the five precepts are, I undertake the precept to refrain from killing, from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which has not been given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. So refraining from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and intoxicants. So this is a, a beautiful list, and uh, there are some, certainly some uh, nuances and ways that that is uh, manifest in, a Buddhist, in the Buddhist teachings, which I'll go into. Um, and yeah, seeing how this might, these are outer trainings, so you can think of them, we're afraid to frame them as precepts, so I undertake the precept. But the Pali word is literally points of training. So these are not commandments, they're not something that the, Buddha, you know, found or, um, yeah, that he just commanded all of us to do, and if we don't do them, when we'll be smited or any kind of punishment will come down from on high. But they're things that we can train in. If we see a value in these, then we can take them on and see if there's value in them. Or when we see them in others, when we see other people who have such an, a sense of integrity that they just bring an aura of truth and lightness. You don't have to worry about this person. They're not going to lie to me. They're not going to hurt me. They're not going to steal from me. I can let my guard down, at least to that extent. So these are outer points of training, outer precepts. And the five hindrances, we can take these on as inner precepts or inner points of training. And so the five hindrances are the training to abandon ill will, the training to abandon uh, agitation, the training to abandon sensual desire, the training to abandon sloth and torpor, and the training to abandon doubt. So that's in a bit, a little bit of a different order than you usually find them in. Uh, you usually find it as refraining or abandoning uh, ill will, or I'm sorry, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and doubt, those five. But uh, we can switch them around to see how they might apply to and have a relationship with these five precepts because uh, it does bring out nuances in, in each list. Um, and we can lean into our strengths. So there is a place on the path for a wholesome sense of ego, for a wholesome sense of self. And the Buddha does even, in a number of places, talk about uh, just recognizing I'm someone who speaks the truth. I'm someone who has a solid sense of integrity. And that bringing about a sense of well-being, internal well-being, when you see the truth of that. I've been training in not lying for however long we've been doing that. And 
it brings about a sense of trust in ourselves. I can trust myself and other people around me can trust me and we can trust each other. It goes in many different ways in the uh, implications and uh, ramifications and yeah, this just, the circles of influence just spread out from ourselves when we're able to trust ourselves in these ways that we won't break the precepts, these, these outer precepts of um, yeah, the five rules of training. And the inner ones bring it to a more subtle level. Um, so it's harder to do. On the level of the body, in Theravada Buddhism, the precepts are all things, they're all actions of body and speech. They're all things which we do with our body. So in Zen Buddhism or in other types of Buddhism, they might talk about one precept. What's the one precept? I'm just going to look after my mind. I'm just going to look after my mind. And I think that's, it's beautiful and it's inspiring. Um, but it's also, that's an extremely refined practice. The mind is more variegated, the Buddha said, than the whole animal kingdom. We got alligators up in there. We got peacocks and... We got snakes, we got tons of snakes, and uh, squirrels, bears. So, yeah, we can't, on one sense, we can trust the mind. We can trust the mind um, that it does its knowing thing. The mind is always knowing, and we can trust the mind in that sense. But on another level, we can't always trust every voice. We can't, don't always trust every voice that comes up in your, in your mind because who knows where that came from, what kind of karmic imprints from the past led to this, uh, whatever random thought that we think. Uh, you are not your, your thoughts. So uh, training our, our, our minds in this way, this is when we look at the hindrances, but with the precepts, we really can not do these actions. So with killing, we don't stab, it's an act of the body, we don't slap, and this is a, a nuance of uh, Theravada Buddhism, a Buddhism. We don't even harm animals. And this includes ants and spiders and mosquitoes and all the things which are slight nuances and which are just, nobody questions it. You go camping and um, yeah, a mosquito comes and bites you and even your grandma will slap the mosquito. Um, my grandma would slap the mosquito. She is a great person, she is a great, uh, person. Um, but it was just not a thing. You know, it's in most world religions, slapping a mosquito just is not a big deal. Um, but in Theravada Buddhism, we do kind of look at things in a different way. Um, the action itself, what is the mind state that it's coming from? So we train both in the mind state and in the physical action. And the physical action is easier to train in. I'm not going to slab, uh, slap. I'm not going to shoot. I'm not going to whatever kind of violent action, that's what the precept is training us in. We're not doing that physical action. On the level of stealing, we're not going to take, we're not going to steal other people's property. On the aspect of sexual misconduct, we don't do that with our physical body. On the aspect of speech, we don't let words that are lies come out of our mouths. We just keep the mouth closed. And this is something we can do. And on the level of intoxicants, just we don't, let it come into the body in the different ways that intoxicants can come into the body. And so these are concrete trainings uh, and why we can't just say, I undertake the precept to refrain from ill will, sensual desire, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry or doubt is because they come up. We've got past karma. Um, we've done and thought all sorts of things in the past and Random thoughts are gonna come up, even if we have the best of intentions for this half hour period, this 15 minute period, I'm just gonna sit with the breath. Who knows what thought is gonna come up from the past? So we can't just cut off thoughts, it's impossible. Um, and the Buddha was wise enough to acknowledge that. So it's a different type of training, the training in abandoning the hindrances. So just collating these, these lists, and this is something you can do in your own practice. Um, how do the three characteristics of impermanence, not self, and uh, unsatisfactoriness, how do those relate to the five aggregates of the body, perception, feeling, mental formation, consciousness, how do they relate to the six internal, external sense spaces, all these different lists, how do they relate to one another? 
So how do the five hindrances relate to the five precepts? And you could do it, think about it in different ways and see how that might help your, your practice, but on the level of mind, so just as we think, I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature, you can take the inner precept, this inner training of I undertake the inner precept to abandon, to abandon ill will. So ill will taken to its extreme is killing. It leads to killing when we have any kind of slight annoyance that builds up over time and creates this uh, murderous intent. And if we can catch it on the level of mind, when we're just sitting trying to watch the breath, if we don't, you know, the, a thought might come up, oh yeah, this thing that my kid said this morning or the thing that my spouse did or my partner or whoever did or this uh, slight physical uh, discomfort, whatever the pulling away, so this is the leaning away from that which just doesn't want to experience what's coming up, whether it's a thought um, or a physical sensation, that's ill will, and we recognize it. So now that you've heard, you can label your thoughts in this way. This is a thought of ill will, and you can undertake, if you see the value in it, I undertake the precept, the inner precept, to abandon ill will. And you can prime yourself in that way um, to lean away from this trajectory of, of violence, uh, which just gets more and more violent. When we kill, it just creates a whole cycle of killing around the world, and we ourselves are the seed which perpetuates all the, uh, yeah, the suffering and violence on societal levels, family levels, uh, geopolitical levels, and it starts just from our own minds and our inability to just be able to sit with that which is uncomfortable. So can you train in this? When you see a thought of ill will come up in mind, I don't like this sensation in my knee. Um, I don't like that. And I could perseverate on that, um, or I could just recognize it. I don't need to lean away from it. If it's something I need to deal with, if it's actually um, something dangerous, I can move my body. But recognizing it, okay, there is a level of aversion here which is unnecessary. It's a second arrow which is unnecessary. I, I see the danger in that. And just as I value the taking of life and value nonviolence, value non-harming on a family level, society level, interpersonal level, I can refrain from this the inner violence of adding this second arrow. So physical dukkha, physical unsatisfactoriness, physical pain, pain is unavoidable, but suffering is optional. So I can not stab myself with the second arrow and cause more trouble. I can undertake this inner precept to refrain from the ill will and aversion to my own discomfort or to uh, the thoughts that I, I don't like to hear. So the next precept, the outer precept of refraining from taking that which is not given, we can equate that to the pre inner precept to refrain or to abandon uh, restlessness and worry. Uh, flurry and worry is another translation. So how does it relate? Uh, just as when we're ill content, when we're not content in the present moment, that's when we, we steal. We take something that hasn't been given. In the same way, we're restless because we don't know how to and are unable to just sit with what is here. We lurch off into the future or we think about the past. We just think this way and that way and, yeah, are just not content with all of the gold that's just waiting for us here in the present moment. So we can undertake this inner precept to abandon the restlessness which takes us away from the, the present moment. Just as I value having integrity in the world that other people can trust me, I'm not gonna take what hasn't been given in the same way what hasn't been given in the present moment, the future and the path, the past. That doesn't mean we can't think of the future and the past, it's just we don't wanna be a slave to the future and the past. Uh, we want to be able to train our minds to be able to, yeah, abandon, thoughts that we can abandon and be with the thoughts that we um, can't yet abandon but which are unwholesome and to encourage wholesome thoughts in the present moment. So 
The third precept, outer precept, is I undertake the precept to abandon sexual misconduct. And I just realized this last week, but uh, the polycanon, very big collection of discourses. It's about 20 times longer than uh, many other scriptural collections, written 2,600 years ago. And one might think, with all those words, when you think about sexual misconduct in a religious context, you might get on, you might kind of be on the edge of your seat. What does that, what does that actually mean? Sexual misconduct, uh-oh. Maybe I don't want to know. I like this meditation thing, but what is sexual misconduct? I'm not going to ask. Um, and you might expect that it has something to do with being gay, but it does not. In all of these books of the poly canon, we have no homophobia. No homophobia, everybody. We win. <laughs> we win. Yes. All right. It's a lot of words. So many words. 2,600 years ago, you would think there'd be some gay bashing in there, but no. There's no smiting. Yes. Just so sexual misconduct on the level of the poly canon is just respecting other people, respecting um, uh, in arrangements. You know, if you have got, you know, come into a relationship with someone, you don't engage with that person in a way which is outside the bounds of, um, yeah, what you, what has been agreed upon. So that's sexual misconduct. The word is kamesu michachara. Micha is, um, yeah, action in relationship to kama, which means sexuality, but also means sensuality. And on the level of hindrances, it's kama chanda. So I undertake the inner precept to abandon sensual desire. Undertake the precept to abandon sensual desire. And this is those unhelpful sensual thoughts which really can just take us out of the present moment. Um, there's a great quote, probably my favorite non-Buddhist quote, which is from Pascal, which is, all of humanity's problems stem from the human inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And there's a lot of wisdom in there, and I'm not sure if it's, you, it's probably true on one level, I'm not sure if it's true on every level, but yeah, why can't we just be with ourselves and sit quietly by ourselves? Um, not that that's what we have to be doing all the time, but having that capacity and not being uh, just beholden to any thought that comes up, um, this is a human trait that we can train in. So. Uh, yeah, I undertake the precept to abandon unhelpful, unhealthy thoughts of sensual desire. And on the level of precepts, we have the precept, I undertake the precept to uh, refrain from lying. And we can equate this with the inner precept, I undertake the inner precept to abandon sloth and torpor. This one's a little bit of a stretch, but um, uh, really, Lying is just a form of cognitive laziness. Um, you don't have to do it. So many people think um, that it's just impossible to avoid lying. Um, that we tell people that you come to a monastery and no one, no one is going to lie to you. Um, and some people just don't believe it, um, that it's possible to have a community like that. But we really do uh, create these spaces where you can trust people. And even if we're saying things that... Um, yeah, other people might not want to be, might not want to hear. We can train to say these things in, in kind ways, and it is a training to be able to speak truthfully and kindly, and to give up this, uh, this laziness of, uh, yeah, just habitual uh, mental um, lethargy that's not creative enough to figure out how to speak the truth. So, and the final outer precept, I undertake the outer precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. And on the level of mind, I undertake the inner precept to abandon doubt. And why is doubt like intoxication? Uh, because the doubt that's being talked to and is being spoken about uh, implied here is a doubt that just has no end. It's the kind of doubt that does not lead to some kind of clarity, but it's the doubt which is just completely self-perpetuating and has no way 
out. It's just, it's almost the emotion of um, just fishing for some kind of answer, um, which we can't know. And it's, um, yeah, you hopefully as we meditate more, you get more familiar with helpful doubts or considerations. Um, yeah, can I trust what this person is saying? Can I trust what this scripture is pointing to? Um, and the unhelpful doubt, which is just a emotion, a habit, which just has no end. As No matter how long I think about this and perseverate on it, I'm not going to reach any level of clarity in being able to recognize that and being able to shift out of that and undertaking the inner precept to abandon that kind of doubt, recognizing this this doubt and uncertainty which just has no end. And another characteristics of the Buddha's teaching, in addition to all having the same taste of liberation, is that it has an end. We can realize in the present moment uh, a complete end to greed, anger, and delusion, a complete end to unnecessary suffering. So these are inner precepts and outer precepts, and you can look at them in your meditation, if you value, if you've already got a strong sense of integrity and you value being someone who other people can trust, other peop who other people can feel safe around, take that valuing of yourself as being someone who is virtuous, is moral, has a sense of integrity into this inner level and say, oh, actually, this thought of this restless way of thinking, I'm someone who values taking not values being able to give up taking what has not been given can i take that integrity sense of physical bodily integrity and bring it to the level of mind and give up these restless thoughts can i give up violent thoughts can i give up uh yeah all of these unhelpful ways of thinking and you can uh, the buddha says if it was not possible to abandon unwholesome states he wouldn't say to do it but because it is possible to abandon unwholesome states he says to do it so we can all do it and um, experiment and see if you can do this and take what's helpful and we just encourage everybody to experiment with seeing how uh, these different lists and um, different frameworks that the Buddha gave us, how they might pair with one another and how they might bring out nuances of one another and just support us in our practice and in our group practice as well. So we'll leave the talk there. Hantamayang damakata satu karam katamase satu 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 anumotami. So we can open things up to questions, and we've got uh, people on Zoom as well. You can raise your cartoon hand if you know how to do that, or raise your physical hand, that works too. And we've got a mic runner, we've got Miles, if anybody has uh, thoughts or questions, uh, you can just raise your hand here and Miles can come. And anybody who wants to, now would be a great time if you wanted to just stand up and shift posture as well. Hi, thank you. That was beautiful and much needed personally. Um, I would love your input on, I've just been noticing lately that, uh, and it's around ill will, that I have these expectations for like societal norms, like how people show up. So you show up on time for a meeting, you don't cut off someone in traffic, which I'm sure many people can relate to. and. I'm noticing that my knee-jerk reaction is really anger and aversion and I kind of spiral in this ill will. And you know, I can get it back <laughs> maybe four hours later, five hours later, and recognize um, that that's not skillful. But I'm wondering if you have any meditation objects or readings that you would recommend in addition to metta, because I do metta and doesn't really seem to come up in that moment where I can have compassion for that other person and, and what they might be going through. Yeah, 
it's a, a great question, and you point to exactly how, um, yeah, training on the cushion can have a direct benefit on our training in the world. You know, not having to say that thing to this person, or not having to, you know, cuss out the guy who just cut us off. And um, uh, on the level of mind, the Buddha had lots of different skillful means around anger and ill will. Um, you can practice metta, and if the Buddha says if that doesn't work, you can practice compassion. This person is also suffering. But as you said, sometimes you can't do that. And you can lean into equanimity. Just for my own peace of mind, I can give up this. Can I give up the, this thought of ill will? It's not actually helping me. And this is another thing you can do, is reflect on the drawbacks. So the Buddha had a great sutta. I can't, certainly can't remember all the things he pointed to, but all of the drawbacks of anger. There's a whole sutta, and maybe there's like 11 different drawbacks of anger. And just reflecting on each of these. When I'm angry at someone, I'm ugly. And that's, I mean, it's pointing to like a, you know, you, it, it, using pride to get rid of pride. And who wants to be ugly angry, you know? And uh, <laughs> you can see it in other people. We can see it in ourselves. And yeah, when I get angry, I get ugly. When I'm angry, I work for my own detriment. And I, other people, the person I'm angry at, when I act on my anger, they might actually be happy if I am so angry that I throw the bell across the room and break the bell. Um, you know, they would be happy. Our enemies are happy when we are angry and out of control. Um, and yeah, just finding creative ways that work for you. Um, Ajahn, do you have any? Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, when the Buddha laid out right intention, which Ajahn Kovilo was speaking to as a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. He named uh, the intention for renunciation, the intention for non-ill will, and the intention for non-cruelty. And I think it's very significant that two of those three are around avoiding aversion because it really is so easy to spend most of our lives in kind of a low-level hum of aversion. It's, it's really where we can abide. And I think the fact that he labeled the Brahma Vihar as the abode of the Brahmas indicates this kind of dichotomy of where do we live. Ajahn Brahmali says the chief function of mindfulness in a day should be keeping a morality and avoiding dwelling in ill will, those two. So I think just acknowledging this is a big one and you'll need a rotating tool belt for it. Um, and just that's just part of, part of this. So yes, metta is very important starting the day off because as soon as you wake up, you're self will try to crystallize around something and anger will be is often the most clear easy go-to so making sure that right when you wake up you crystallize the self around metta just be very guarded those first 15 minutes to just bring your mind straight to a mindfulness object loving kindness and that'll pay dividends through the rest of the day by changing our trajectory um, the other things i think are really useful is, is labeling it is, can be helpful, just anger, resentment. Sometimes that's enough. Another one is acknowledging that Mara will strike right where the relationship is the most precious. So just saying, I see you, Mara. Um, I see you. And I've spoken of this before, but I really think one of the most powerful tools is just acknowledging um, that, well, first, if, if we're practitioners and we have enough trouble behaving. Think of all the people who have none of the tools that we've had, none of the blessings we've had. How can we expect so much? Um, in the Brothers Karamazov, brother, Father Zosima says you th should think of people like they're children or patients in a hospital. And I think if things are really bad, you can think about them as children in a hospital. <laughs> and that's really helpful. Um, and the final thing is just this idea that you know, in the Mahayana conception, bodhisattvas will split off part of their mind and send it down as the difficult boss or the drunk on the street um, and to teach you patience. And how else would we learn to expand our hearts? And the most powerful reading I'd recommend is the Eight Verses of Mind Training in the Tibetan tradition. You can Google it, the Eight Verses of Mind Training. So I, um, with the aspiration for the benefit of all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, 
I will constantly practice holding them dear. Whenever I encounter someone of difficult nature, I will, oh no, whenever I interact with others, I will hold myself as lowest of all um, and offer uh, and hold others as supreme. In all actions, I will examine my mind for defilement and as soon as I see it, confront and avert it for it is of great harm. Whenever I encounter someone of unpleasant nature, I will hold them close as a wish, as a precious jewel, for they are rare to find. When others mistreat me out of jealousy, I will offer the, uh, I will humbly accept upon myself defeat and offer the victory to them, and so on. So these are extreme inversions, but they're potent if held with wisdom. So I'd say, yeah, like just developing a tool belt that you're constantly on guard against. And the Buddha called anger, anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root. So there is a honeyed tip. Thank you both. Hi. Um, first of all, for the um, what Christine was saying about traffic and responding in, in a version. I think traffic is my biggest patience practice. And I notice that when I'm impatient, all the slow cars get in front of me. <laughs> it's like it just it's like a magnet. And when I and when I'm okay, I mean it's kind of funny. I don't know I don't understand it fully, but it, but it's true. True for me. <laughs> the other list that I the first list that I learned was the uh, was the six sense doors. And, um, and I love how all the lists work together. They really do. And, and bringing in, you know, the, the, the eight um, trainings of the mind. I mean, it, this, they all work together in a, in a, as memory aids, really, in, in many ways. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you, Cheryl. Your list love counteracts that other guy's list hate. So thank you. We've got a question from the chat. Uh, are there specific suttas about how to work with the inner mental hindrance of doubt? Yeah, just, I mean, one um, great discourse, there's a, a fantastic little book called The Five Hindrances by Nyanaponika, which really collates, brings together all sorts of different quotes from the Pali Canon um, about each of the, the hindrances. And one useful simile that's brought up um, is relating each of these hindrances to a bowl of water. So the hindrance of doubt is like, if we're trying to see ourselves in a bowl of water, see our own reflection, the reflection of our face, it works best when you're outside and it's light and the water is clear. Whereas sensual desire is like having dye in the water. You're not seeing clearly, you're seeing through red or green or whatever. Ill will is like the water is boiling and you can't see yourself because there are all these bubbles coming to the surface. Uh, sloth and torpor is like water that has um, moss and algae on the top of it. And restlessness and remorse is like water that is just windy. You've got like a hurricane brewing on the water. And doubt is like water which is muddy and stirred up and has been placed in a closet. So, yeah, it's just, as long as it's in the closet and the mind is muddy, uh, you won't be able to see yourself clearly, see your own benefit, the benefit of others, or the benefit of both. So that's just a beautiful, sometimes these similes are, are all, it, all it takes. Um, you can just drop that into the mind. Um, but Ajahn. Ajahn Amaro, speaking of traffic, says that you should remember for everyone else your traffic. And uh, <laughs> I think there's also something about skillful means with like, if you find yourself shaking your fist, just replace the words with, may you be well and happy. <laughs> <laughs> may you achieve loving kindness and just see how that goes. As to doubt, the one of the most famous suttas, and I love those five bowls, um, is uh, the Kalama Sutta. And it's the Kalamas, uh, these people approaching the Buddha and saying, we hear all these different teachings and don't know which, who to believe. And instead of saying, believe me, um, the Buddha says, you are, it is right that you are doubtful, Kalamas. You are in doubt about a doubtful matter. And then he says, he asks them, 
if one acts out of uh, the defilements, out of greed, hatred, and delusion, does that lead to one's own benefit or detriment? And they say, if you act out of defilement, it leads to your own detriment. And so he says, whenever you encounter those, you should act from the wholesome. And this is what gets quoted a lot because the Buddha's off sort of saying, don't rely on scripture or all these things, but rely on your own internal compass of what's wholesome and unwholesome. But then he goes on, and this is the part that doesn't get quoted as much. And he says, what is praised or censured by the wise? So supplementing your own doubt about what should I do with, okay, what do, um, what would my teacher say about this? And often that will invoke a very clear answer. And then the third part, which people really often miss, is he says, develop the Brahma Viharas, loving kindness. And that's not insignificant because loving kindness is such a simple, clear, beautiful state that it's like a mirror. And if you find yourself able to get to a place of metta and you bring up the issue that you're confronting or thinking about, often there will be a clarity there waiting for you because the mind state is simple and pure. So I think that's the sutta I would point to as well. Thank you. I um, uh, really appreciate all the wisdom that I'm hearing today. Um, the question comes up about how do you recommend approaching boundaries? So the sort of the notion of, um, you know, something something happens and you don't want to be angry or you want to, you know, not let the anger motivate you, hate the action without hating the actor, um, get out of the way of the oncoming train, but do it with less drama, all of these ideas. So can you speak to sort of standing up for yourself in situations where that's appropriate um, without, you know, in, in this tradition? Yeah, it's a great, uh, great question. There's lots of different uh, ways of talking about boundaries, wholesome boundaries, helpful boundaries, and unhelpful, unwholesome, um, unhealthy boundaries. Uh, on the level of, it sounds like healthy boundaries, knowing what's good for oneself and what's good for one's practice, um, and keeping to that, that's yeah, essential to learn how to do that, both for oneself and when you're interacting with the world. So this comes up really frequently when someone learns about these precepts, and then suddenly you find yourself, if you do see that there's some benefit to these, and you think, oh, why don't I at least try these out? Or it seems like that could be a good idea to you know, give up whatever uh, we're trying to give up. But then you meet with society, like that last precept of giving up drinking um, or something. You know, you might suddenly find when you give it up that there's, you're living in various cultures that it's the norm, and not just the norm, but um, really the expected norm that you, you're drinking too. And so finding you have to be somewhat skillful, agile, and creative in, um, yeah, not lying, but not creating needless um, needless trouble for yourself. Like if you're at a, if you have to go to a, a party or a cocktail party and everybody else is drinking, you can just carry around a, a glass of water, ice water or something else if it's more exciting. Um, but yeah, and that's the same with all of the, the precepts is really knowing what will support us and being as skillful as possible um, in implementing that. You know, the Buddha gave these, like the skeleton, these frameworks, um, but the Buddha or any person in the past or really anybody else in the, the present can't really tell us how to live all these things. You know, the rubber meets the road and um, yeah, we'll encounter people and relatives and family who push our buttons because they know our buttons better than anybody else. And um, yeah, you kind of have to, you know, do it standing up, so, um, and there's space for that, the creativity around that. Ajahn? Yeah. Um, that's a great question, and there is room for m working with external circumstances as Buddhists, not just kind of dealing with it all internally. Um, I'd say that in terms of establishing boundaries um, it's one really useful way of knowing how to work with that skillfully is the Buddha gave 
conditions for admonishment that we have to fulfill before we can give feedback to another monastic. So we have to be speaking truthfully at the right time. That's really important. Uh, from a heart of loving kindness. So you never get to vent your spleen. Like you always wait until that rush of anger is gone. And then when you speak from a different place, it just changes the conversation completely and you ask for permission. There are others, but that firewall is immensely helpful because then you'll have a lot more clarity on, okay, where does this boundary actually have to lie and how can I enforce it skillfully? Um, I'd say another really useful means is um, using, sometimes it can be hard to assert our own boundaries from our from a place, you know, we kind of can tend to be quite soft and, you know, we want to please. So establishing impersonal rules for ourselves that we can invoke that aren't us responding, but rather us invoking a prior determined uh, determination. Um, so, for example, um, if you go visit family, can you commit to a spiritual friend, all right, at 7 p.m., uh, I'm going to go meditate. And then it's not you disengaging from family dinner, being like, sorry guys, I'm out. It's just being like, actually, I made a commitment. I'm sorry, I need to go meditate. Or you can say that a monk told you to do that, and I'm telling you to do that right now. <laughs> Is, uh, um, so having those impersonal frameworks to rely on that you establish ahead of time is, it just takes a lot of the friction out. Um, and yeah, just knowing when something's making you feel weak, disintegrated. If you're going to your job and feeling like you're compromising your seal and just feel that weakening in yourself, then that's a big deal. And finding skillful means to navigate that is, is essential. Does that help at all? Okay. Maybe, maybe one more question? If there was one. Yeah, please. Um, I have a statement and a question. When I'm driving and uh, it's frustrating out there, I think of the phrase, you never know what battles people are going through. And so when I get frustrated with them, I just kind of imagine, like, what could they be going through right now? Um, what's making them drive erratically? What's making them cut me off? Maybe they're on the way to the hospital to see their kids. Um, so I just kind of imagine these scenarios. And then the second thing is, is I'm really allergic to mosquitoes. And I'm also allergic to Benadryl. So not killing mosquitoes doesn't work for me. <laughs> well, on the aspect of... Uh, compassion for other drivers. That's awesome. This is why this is why all of you came here. It wasn't just to hear some monks say some stuff, but all of you have wisdom. We haven't been driving cars for like a decade or more. So like get your road rage wisdom from everybody else. And um, yeah, after this, we will have a, a potluck and please do talk with other people. And there is a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of practice here in the room. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. That's really beautiful. And how about like mosquito repellent. Um, well, the only thing that keeps them away is DEET, and DEET is horrible. I mean, I can put some on my foot and taste it in two seconds. Is there new stuff? Oh. I will talk to Matt about new stuff. Yeah. Matt and Sarah. New and, stuff, everybody. And Greg and new Sarah. Stuff. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but it is great, and there's totally a space just to be totally practical about those things and find ways to navigate our own circumstances. Yeah, and um, no, it, it's, it is important to navigate. Um, and the precepts, it's interesting, like, It, it requires sacrifice to keep them. You know, moving into the workplace, there's been a few people, one person spoke a few months ago to me, and their situation had a slight um, 
something they were slightly associated with that was dishonest and it wasn't an explicit lie, but they thought it was okay enough. And then it just kept wearing at them over the, the months until finally they, they quit the job and it, it meant a huge change. They had to move, they had to change their country of residence because of this, but the lightning of the heart was so palpable that they returned and just said like, those five precepts were so key. And I think that's a really good navigation in the sense that as you take these training rules on, if you find that you're kind of wavering on one and you can't really put it down and keep thinking about it and not thinking about it, it's important to know, um, Ajahn Lee said the nimitta, the sign of sila is samadhi. So the, the sign of good morality is unification. And what I think that means is that if you find you're wavering on any specific point again and again and chewing it over, knowing that that in itself might be a reason just to give it up because the point of sila is that simplicity. So if you're still using your you know, friend's Netflix password and you're like, I don't know if this is totally all right, but I really want to see whatever's on Netflix, um, you know, and that just keeps eating at you a little bit, then that's, that's it. That's the answer right there. So yeah, the monks aren't here to, you know, uh, admonish or judge or anything. Um, people live in the world and as you work with these, um, you know, we, but these are the precepts that the Buddha was, was, did really put out there to hold and people have sacrificed their lives to hold these precepts. They've died to hold them. So they, it does sometimes require a, a sacrifice and, um, uh, but once again, um, more just that when you navigate them over time, just notice how the heart feels around it over your practice and that'll help guide you towards skillful using of them. So I hope that made sense a bit. And yes, I, I understand. So <laughs> um, we do have to wrap things up now. So maybe we could read the chanting request 